it is, as usual, uh, a great pleasure to be back in Rome. Uh, as a Roman, uh, it's always uh, very nice to be invited back. Um, I would like to thank the organizers and the host, of course, uh, for this uh, privilege. But in particular, uh, uh, Ludovica Glorioso, Lieutenant uh, Glorioso, who is here, and uh, Dr. Tadeo uh, for taking care of us in such a wonderful way. I uh, thought about some possible metal-related uh, complement that I could use, gold uh, or uh, silver, but I thought it was inappropriate in a digital age, so I should not do that. Um, my uh, talk uh, will be uh, philosophical, uh, so I will be tempted to apologize for that. I shall not, uh, since the title of this conference has ethics in the keywords. Uh, philosophy is at home uh, in the context. Uh, what I will uh, be uh, more tempted to do is to apologize for a couple of points that might actually be slightly abrasive uh, when uh, here and there uh, some of you will potentially recognize uh, implicit targets. Those of you who don't see the targets, I'm delighted. Those of you who see and have the impression of having been targeted, yes you are. Uh, target number one. Uh, someone somewhere thought that that was not a new weapon. That the elephant in the room could be dealt with in two ways. You could deny its existence or affirm its irrelevance. You have met both. You have met people uh, denying the existence of Cyber threats of any kind, of course, is more the same. Uh, please don't even talk about it. Uh, we have the ways and the whereabouts to deal with this. We've been here before. Or, and you have met that kind of uh, strategy as well, well, the elephant in the room is in the room, but it's irrelevant. It's more of the same uh, Cold War and everything else. We've been there before, don't worry. Now, I'm afraid that uh, the Romans paid a high price when they denied the existence of the elephant, or underestimate their relevance. Uh, it was a long time ago, 280 uh, BC, and I am in the right place where I do not need to explain what happened. Uh, what I do need to explain is that it took a long while before the Romans realized how to deal with the problem. Uh, 200 years and a bit later, uh, it was, of course, the genius of Julius Caesar who realized that something had to be done about that elephant in the room do not listen to those who deny its existence. Do not listen to those who affirm its irrelevance. They are there, they are important. So you better start equipping your legions with access and make sure that those people, I cannot even start imagining what it means to go running towards an elephant that is attacking you full speed armed with an axe. There was a time when courage had a different sense from being behind a computer. Uh, well, you run against that uh, sort of elephant armed with a, an axe, I remind you, and you chop their legs. Um, well, we also had a different conception in terms of uh, animal ethics at that time, uh, but it did, it did succeed. Caesar did won uh, the battle at Thapsus, and the Fifth Legion did get the elephant as its symbol. What I'm going to invite you to do is to get the cyber war symbol and on it, because let us not wait for 200 years before we realize how to deal with the elephant in the room. It's there, it's relevant, and for goodness sake, we have just realized it this in these years. So listen to some of us who are screaming at the top of their voices, please make sure the future generations don't look backwards and say, for goodness sake, another Heraclea battle? Haven't you learned anything from the past? So that was uh, the longish uh, incubate. Um, the talk is divided into six points, um, and I shall try to use my 27 or so minutes left, uh, a bit less probably, uh, wisely. But I'm sure that wisdom will be imposed on me if not exercise. So I shall uh, remind you very quickly and briefly, uh, because I know you know, and it's just a matter of being on the same page, what are the three ethical questions that we normally deal with when we do some ethical thinking? And then uh, an episode in the history of humanity, something that has changed uh, our way of behaving with the world, how we've been enveloping or structuring 
the world around RCTs rather than vice versa. This is important to realize. And why within that particular environment, we've been raising boundaries, significant boundaries for conflicts. The second half will be the question, so what happens to conflicts in a world that has been structured around uh, technologies and within which some fundamental boundaries we used to have when Napoleon was around, or even maybe during the Cold War, do not apply anymore. What happens to the new elephant? And I shall uh, explore quickly uh, what it means to uh, have uh, conflicts in cyberspace and try to convince you that there's one right way of looking at this and, of course, there for a wrong way. Uh, I will not anticipate, uh, hoping that this will keep you awake, uh, but the key word will be infosphere. What happens to conflicts within the infosphere and why we need a kind of information ethics that is the sort of strategy behind the problem. Why in the uh, information ethics can actually be the ax you need to deal with the elephant. So, three questions first. This, I hope you will forgive me, I know you know, so do not allow me to patronize you. But just in case we were confused, what are the real fundamental questions that we ask when we're doing ethics? Uh, who should I be? The sort of self-constructive, poiesis, construction, the self-poietic question that uh, anyone has asked since we were doing philosophy in Athens, fifth century before Christ. Uh, that's the virtue ethics. And in our context, for example, should the uh, military personnel be courageous? I know it's an old value. I'm using it on purpose. And uh, I remind you about uh, being behind a computer versus having an ax. So who should I be? The other question is, what is the right thing to do? That's the substantive thing. Now, there are options there, and I, if I could do the right thing, I would. It's just that I don't know, and you know, you could tell me. And your next friend who is actually asking you, should I or should I not join the army, is asking that particular question. And then next, uh, why should I do it in the first place? The motivational, which Selma has already raised, I believe rather unsuccessfully, I'm afraid, uh, during the first half of the morning. But the attempt was valid. We do need to address that too. Uh, so the uh, motivational will be distinguished from the substantive and will be distinguished from the self-poietic, not because they are separate, but because first you keep your ingredients separate and then you mix them. You never cook by mixing everything together, whatever you have in the fridge. Let's be careful. So a bit of minimalism, not because things are that simple, but because making them more complex is easy afterwards. You get that? Keep them simple first, make them complex later. Do not start with the complex because the simple disappears. So let's keep them simple and concentrate on only one question. What is the right thing to do in the context of cyber conflict? Point number two. Um, what is the context of cyber conflict? Where, where all this is happening? Uh, is there any change? Uh, remember the elephant? Well, the envelope in the world, which will uh, uh, engage us for the next five minutes or so, uh, is um, something that I would like to sketch with a very long perspective. The further the jump, the longer the run up. And if you have to jump very far, you take several steps back. So if the problem is big, you better step back and back and back. So we step back all the way to prehistory, the distinction between prehistory and history, and that is when you have ICTs appearing. Um, that's the difference between no way of recording, recording the present and communicating to the future uh, versus a time when finally you have ways of recording and sort of communicating uh, to the future so that individual social uh, well-being start being related to ICTs. There's no Roman Empire without uh, writing. There's no British Empire without way of communicating. Uh, I won't speak about other empires. At that point, you start thinking that anything else is going to be more of the same. Recording, communicating, communicating, recording. Until as, and I'm so glad to come after uh, Giovanni and his uh, very enlightening talk, until you realize that there's a third element in the ICT business, and that is processing. Books do not process their words. Computers do. And anyone who's comparing the uh, internet, the computer revolution, to the good American revolution, the book revolution, is stuck in the Middle Age, hasn't seen anything, hasn't understood anything. Because, of course, it's recording, transmitting, communicating, and processing that makes a difference. Processing becomes the essential part of a new society. 
and a society where individual and social well-being start being dependent entirely on ICTs. You are sitting on top of it. So with a quick, uh, I hope memorable uh, phrase, those who live by the digit die by the digit. And the replacement of a sword with a digit is crucial. Uh, let's not mix the metaphor, let's not talk about the axe, but basically is from a material, energy-based kinetic to a immaterial, information-based way of uh, having to do with the world. Any added value, anything else that you want to do is going to be information-related. In fact, it actually depends on information, a lot of information. We were all born out of that picture. Um, since we were born as humanity, until 2009, we produced 0 0.8 zettabyte. Do not allow me to tell you what zettabyte is. It's huge. It's a lot of stuff. It's anything we have ever, ever written, produced, spoken about, uh, blah, blah, from year zero in the cave to 2008. And between 2008 and uh, 2020, we will have produced another 35 zettabytes. Take one, add another, more or less. That's 35 times more than we have ever done in the whole history of humanity. Staggering, yes. Does it make a difference? You bet. It's a huge elephant. So that obviously is um, an important threshold. Uh, thresholds can be overcome. Someone can always tell you the territory on this side is the same thing as the territory on the other side, more of the same. Yes, but it is a threshold. You better have a passport because this is France and that is Italy. So do not be confused by the fact that there is continuity when continuity comes with a barrier. Now, what kind of uh, continuity are we talking about? Well, there's more of the same, well, not quite, but above all, there's going to be more of all this. There are only three limits to what we can uh, predict about the future, and I'm talking to the military uh, in particular. Thermodynamics, basically your physics, your intelligence, what you're going to do with the computers and uh, your inventions, your algorithms and everything else, and memory, the platform on which all this is residing. Of course, all this comes with huge problems, acquisition and storage, usability, security and safety, accessibility, analytics, law and ethics. And for each entry, you could have a special division dealing just with that, because for every entry, you have a particular problem on the cyber conflict level. So complicated, easy to make, because we could spend the rest of the uh, 20 minutes or so, probably less, uh, discussing every point. I won't do that, but I would like to call your attention to the fact that anyone who's going to tell you, oh, surely we have the right ways of doing this, surely, no, let's say, good old Greek ways of dealing with uh, conflicts have been with us for a long while, we can just reapply that, is missing the boat. All that, and that's the bad news, comes with a price tag every time. So if there's in, one more message to take from what I'm saying is cyber war is expensive, really expensive. And uh, if we want to think about the future, we need to buy the axes now because the elephants are coming. So what happens in all this? What happens in all, within this, this world that is being soaked with information? I speak information and data as if it were, there were no difference. There's a difference you want to know. I'll tell you later, but it, it, it's deadly boring. Um, but with all this data uh, floating around, well, we've been thinking about ways of handling all this data autonomously. There are two things we do dislike in life. Working and thinking. We have done pretty well with working, that's the engine, and thinking we're doing our very best with the computer. One day we might actually stop thinking completely if the computer does its job as well as the engine. Until that time, we need something that looks like an intelligence. It, trust me, I hope uh, Giovanni will agree with me. We have, at the moment, in terms of intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence, what uh, my grandmother had in her fridge zero. But we have a lot of smart technology. They do what they're supposed to do, and they do it increasingly well for a larger and larger number of tasks. So what has been happening in the meanwhile with all this data and the world? Well, we thought that the real task was to make sure that we had some artificial intelligence that could deal with the world as we deal with the world, as successfully, as intelligently, start slow, start small, but sooner or later. Meanwhile, instead of saying, well, what kind of intelligence do we want to develop for the world? We were adapting the world 
to the smart technologies. And that's where uh, a concept from um, industrial robotics is going to help. It's called envelope, and in robotics, it's actually the 3D space within which their arm is successful. It's a very simple idea. I mean, you do not unleash a robot in a room and ask the robot, build me a car. You build a whole building around the very simple abilities of that robot, and that's called an envelope. So, to come back home, and uh, I'm, since I'm not quite sure whether we are recording this or not, I better be careful with reference to my wife. Um, uh, to get what the envelope is and is not, compare um, the old dishwasher. The dishwasher is a classic context in which we have enveloped a whole world around a very simple robot. Choo -choo 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 -choo. Bit of soap. Choo -choo -choo -choo. Well, clearly, you would not clean, no, do the dishes that way. No, that I would not recommend it. No. When I was in the army, we did something similar, but I won't brag about that. That's another story. Um, so we build, uh, as the philosopher would say, a whole ontology around the abilities of the agent in question. I'm talking about a dishwasher. Uh, this is a stupid idea. Uh, it's something that we don't have, and we don't even know how to build. Not the particular thing in, in, in question, but uh, something like that that then also walks out of the room and drives your car, and, uh, I don't know, picks up the uh, post and uh, actually types for you the last essay. That is something that we don't even know how to start building. But there is something very smart, that. Because that is doing what I'm doing, is replacing me as an interface between the dishes in the sink and the envelope of the world. That is the world as we know it. That's what's happening now. We're building more and more enveloped environments, and we're building interfaces that can start talking between environments. So that is the sort of smart universe with which we have to cope. And do not listen to anyone who's actually trying to sell you just the dishwasher or the robot. Uh, target anyone? Yeah, I hope so. Um, and if, again, anyone has any impression that we're you know, shifting towards pure philosophy, past the enveloping was a standalone phenomenon, a factory, or you actually bought the whole envelope with the gadget. Uh, today is uh, a whole construction of the environment around AI-friendly um, uh, features, what I would like to call, just for lack of a better terminology, an infosphere. If you don't like it, think of something else. And then again, since we are in Europe, we better consider what's happening in Europe. Uh, this is how Europe is enveloping Europe. Um, this comes from the digital agenda and, and refers to about 20% of the EU population using a laptop to access the internet via a wireless uh, while away from home or work. Pause. They're not home. They're not at work. Where the heck are they? Everywhere. They're in the street, in the car, at the shop, Starbucks, because they never leave the computer. They are always within this enveloping uh, environment. It's going to be a robust, cumulative, progressively refining trend. The envelope with which we are dealing is growing quickly. Those are uh, the last features, um, sorry, uh, figures that I could find, um, Reuters. Um, if you see the uh, red uh, tag, for those of you too far away, I can read it aloud. Uh, that was between 20, uh, sorry, 2003, uh, 2010, when uh, we finally had more connected devices than people. Um, Moving forward, uh, you can see that in 2020, um, there is, uh, that doesn't really fit, uh, uh, the um, number of people and the number of uh, uh, devices um, will be 7.6 people versus 50 billion devices connected. You have a way of dealing with those 50 billion devices that is not particularly nice. That is, you get it, a big elephant in the room. So uh, let's think about 2020. Let's not think about Napoleon, because trust me, Napoleon had different strategies for a different world. The new world in which we live is something that maybe grandma had an experience of. When she worked, she used to walk inside the computer. The computer was the room, and she had a screwdriver. Her daughter came out of the computer. The computer became something that she had in front. Her granddaughter uh, is back inside. And is that environment that we need to protect is not something else that is different from uh, the world. So hacking is not like hacking your, say, uh, mobile. That would be so wrong. If you hack the information society, 
if you are intruding the infosphere, it's like saying that you are actually hacking the heart of their society. You are hacking the peacemaker of their society. And anyone who says, well, hasn't, nothing has happened so far, so surely we can get along with that. Well, I don't want to live in a society where the peacemaker is unprotected and anyone can actually hack it one way or another. Again, you don't have to believe me. Uh, maybe one of our representatives, um, Neil Kroos, Vice President of the European Commission, she, uh, commenting on Cyber Europe 2010, the first pan-European cyber attack simulation, said, aloud for those of you too far away, this exercise to test Europe's preparedness against cyber threats is an important first step towards working together to combat potential online threats to essential, essential infrastructure and ensuring citizens and businesses feel safe and secure online. It doesn't get any more hyper-historical than that, quite naturally. So, um, because I know that uh, we're running out of time, but trust me, the next slides get lighter and uh, shorter. Let me go through that uh, slightly more quickly, because now the, the framework is in place. So within this uh, infosphere, these hyper-historical societies, the boundaries are being erased. There's a constant blurring between reality and virtuality. Um, when you had a sword uh, or a gun, that wasn't the case. This is happening under our eyes. And of course, there's also a blurring of the distinction between human, machine, and nature. That is just an experiment whereby you can actually use uh, your uh, uh, brain scanner to control a drone. Uh, lots of issues here. Um, so in this case, once again, novelties, remarkable uh, differences that we need to take into account if we want to have a clear understanding of the ethics behind. So shouldn't be just speaking about cyberspace altogether? Well, here's the picture that I want to uh, summarize quickly. We have technology on one hand, uh, growing and growing, and time uh, passing by. We used to uh, kill each other on land, and this is a very you know, well-known story to most of us. We discovered that we could actually kill each other at sea, uh, so we expanded. Uh, there is no Roman Empire without control of the Mediterranean. And of course, air at a certain point became essential, so there is no Second World War uh, uh, domination without having the right airplanes. And at some point, uh, space became essential. I mean, you, uh, you know, Cold War and all the satellites and everything else. We thought we had seen everything. Meanwhile, we were building three weapons. We have cybernetics to build robots. We decided that uh, the Second World War could be won also by building a gadget called computer, Alan Turing. And the Cold War required something called the Internet. These are three major technologies that make the difference in cyber war. They were built for war-related, conflict-related uh, reasons. Just by thinking about why we had built those things, we could have predicted that they were going to fire back. They were weapons in the first place. How can we be surprised that they are being used as weapons now? That, that was their state in nature. But uh, thinking is uh, a commodity that we don't often uh, uh, interact with. So we've decided, OK, there's a fifth space, cyberspace. Here is the temptation that we might be uh, running into. Whatever we talk in terms of ethics, risks, rights, and responsibilities, there are five environments we need to take into account, risks, rights, and responsibilities within the new environment. It's a risk. Why? Well, because if you sort of think about what I told you before, the idea wasn't that we were adding on an extra module to the world. So there's this and one and X and number five. And someone may actually start thinking, oh, surely one day there will be a number six, whatever. No, that's not the thought. The thought is that we're actually transforming the environment within which all this is happening. So that's why I prefer to talk uh, about infosphere. Technology is progressively removing constraints that sort of uh, are uh, featuring conflicts. The when you have a conflict, the where you can have a conflict, the who is involved in a conflict, the how you actually engage in a conflict, and every technology makes a difference on, on it, each of these points. I remind you about cybernetics, the computer and the internet being weapons in the first place. And for the first time in the history of humanity, we have democratized weapons. Now that comes from medical applications. It doesn't mean democracy as in politics. It means something slightly different. It means that now we have, in the hands of an increasingly large number of people, the data and the processing power that can be transformed into a weapon. 
it's like saying that from now on, no, these days, we don't, uh, we don't have just the doctors in power when it comes to your medical records. You also have your medical records, you can check things, you can actually go there with your Wikipedia entry. Well, likewise, you know, in terms of conflicts, the number of people involved and the boundaries that they were distinguishing uh, different combatants are being reshaped completely. So I'd rather suggest that we should treat the whole thing as informed by a digital perspective or informational perspective, as we would rather say. The reasons being that we are, at the same time, unifying strength and weakness. The digital, of course, as I said uh, originally, is both a weapon and a target. It's because we live in a hyper-historical society that is so dependent on the digital that that society also has the means to attack another society digitally or being attacked by a non-state entity. And let's archive Westphalia. is not working in economics. is not working anymore in politics. Surely it doesn't work in analyzing conflicts. Not because it's wrong, but because we need more. So don't get me wrong. It's not that the state is no longer an agent. It's just that it now finds itself surrounded by a number of other agents. Agents that are not state, they are groups, organizations, flexible, they organize themselves around issues, they disappear from one day to the next, they have the power, democratization of being in a uh, uh, rather hostile, and of course, because we are a hyper historical society, Europe, Italy, NATO, we are also have that weakness on one side. We can be actually harmed by the same weapons that we are uh, relying on. Of course, there are many other things that are being erased, the combatant versus non combatant what is or is not a battlefield, uh, what is and what is not a military, military target. So the new real asymmetric point here, and I cannot emphasize this enough, is not between tank versus computer. There's so much yesterday. The real difference is between societies that are hyper-historical, rely so much on ICTs that they have the means, but also the weakness to be attacked, but societies which are not, which do not have that weakness. So when you have a conflict between, say, excuse me, uh, a particular, say, one of the uh, members uh, of a NATO, and a group that doesn't have an infrastructure you can actually uh, put on its knees, but is relying on an infrastructure to harm you, well, that is the kind of asymmetric nature of the conflict that we haven't explored yet, and that's the elephant that we need to uh, deal with. So I'd rather give you a different picture, and I'm coming to the end of my talk. The risks and rights and responsibilities that come under the general uh, discussion of ethics, and remember, of all the questions about ethics, I address, or sorry, I pointed the finger towards only one, is what is the right thing to do? Well. In that context, I would rather like to see people who are experts discuss land, sea, airspace within an informational environment because we are moving there. Don't think about today and tomorrow, 2020, 2050, and surely this is a trend that is uh, stepping forward rapidly in that direction. So finally, we need to discuss what kind of ethics we need for information conflicts. And the kind of ethics that we could uh, start um, developing is an ethics that has this more inclusive, more environmental, the uh, playing with words is meant, that can take into account the whole set of uh, issues for conflicts that address different spaces from a time perspective that makes those spaces part of the single space, the infosphere. So we must rethink the ethics of war in view of this major conceptual shift and that's the conclusion. That's why I would like to end with suggesting that uh, the information ethics in question is a kind of environmentalism. These are the uh, four suggestions that I made in the past. Uh, the book was uh, kindly mentioned by Dr. Tadeo in The Ethics of Information. Um, I'll read them quickly. This is the last slide of, of my presentation. Entropy ought not to be caused in the infosphere. Uh, where by, by entropy, I do not mean the thermodynamic or concept. Uh, if you find that uh, can't intuitive, just think in terms of destruction, annihilation, ruining something. So, say, destruction ought to be prevented in the infosphere, ought to be removed by the infosphere. So when we talk about conflicts, we're also talking about intervention for peaceful reasons. It's not always just no, 
A and B fighting each other for the wrong reasons. It's also us intervening in particular contexts, doing the right thing for the right reasons. And that is you know, removing from the intersphere the uh, evil caused by this sort of entropy, and of course, promoting the flourishing of informational entities at all levels, as well as of the environment, by preserving, cultivating, and enriching their well-being. Now, this is something that even Thomas Aquinas, I bet, will be quite happy about it. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much. Do we have, uh, thank you very much, Richard. Do we have any questions? Randall, please. Randy Dipert. I have a quick technical question and then a bigger question. Uh, the quick te technical question is, although the term digital is ubiquitous, it does not seem to me to be an essential part of information pro uh, processing or the infosphere. It happens to be the one we use. And there is speculation about going back to analog uh, computers. So, and sometimes, too, people throw in the electronic, and that is probably wrong, too, because it can be electromagnetic or other things. But the bigger point was, uh, in my paper, and even more in the written version, I really go after the analogy of, with cyberspace. And my problems are really serious, I think, now. I don't know what counts as movement in it. I don't know what its geometry is. I don't know its number of dimensions. I don't know where the boundaries and, boundaries and borders are. And uh, those seem to me to be pretty important notions for a space. And it, it just does not seem to have some of the most characteristic features of a space as we use it in physics. Yes. Um, I uh, welcome the first point about the digital. We shouldn't be so obsessed about the digital. The digital is just the, sorry for the term, philosophical terminology, just the specific ontology that we're using. Mm -hmm. It could be analog, it, could, it, it wouldn't make a major difference. There is one point to be said in favor of the digital. is infinitely more uh, prone to be processed easily uh, than the analog, but that is just a, a feature of the physics itself. Uh, so I'm, I'm 100% with you uh, re by remarking that yes, uh, it's not a matter of ontology. The revolution is not digit versus analog. The revolution is processing now that was not there before. Whatever makes it easy, next thing you can know is an, uh, some kind of uh, weird computer we haven't even invented. On the space issue, um, we need to be careful because uh, unfortunately there are many concepts of space the one you mentioned is one, and is the most intuitive, is the one that would be, say, uh, yeah, would go hand in hand with a Westphalian context. Is the geographical space of some kind. is known by logicians, uh, that is my profession, as Euclidean space. Let me give you to anyone else uh, the uh, example. I, forgive me, this is really first year undergraduate example. So if you know, please, don't think that I'm uh, uh, sort of patronizing you. When we teach uh, undergraduates that there are more ways of understanding space, uh, the easiest way is to play a game. Take the chessboard. A chessboard is not a Euclidean space. It's a logical space because the distance between the queen and the pawn looks very different, depending on whether you are the queen or the pawn. It's a one step for the queen and it's many steps for the pawn. So that symmetry, it would be like saying that depending on whether you are in Rome or Milan, it takes a different you know, number of kilometers. Surely not in real world. Uh, yes, on the chessboard, if you are the queen, it's just one go. If you are the pawn, it takes all those steps. That's a very simple, and I said, uh, oversimplified example of why being uh, reliant on intuitions about geography, um, say the war uh, room where we have a nice map where tanks move one way or the other and the submarine is placed in the right place is important, is necessary, but it's hugely insufficient because you would be mistaking the chessboard for a Euclidean space. Of course, we are also dealing with Euclidean space, but what I'm saying is that their space is a limit of the concept of space that we have. It would be like saying, Look, just because uh, something is 
in the extreme case so and so, then everything is so and so. No, actually, uh, geography, Euclidean space is just a limit uh, of a much wider concept. If we adopt the wider concept, then cyberspace uh, not only becomes uh, perfectly fine, but it becomes a, a place where we better be careful about our assumptions. Our intuitions that have been so helpful uh, for all these years need to be seriously revised. What I'm warning everybody here, myself first of all included, is let's be careful about our conceptual deficit. Thinking that we have the right concept in our pockets means not seeing the elephant. It means that, for example, you mistake cyberspace as a logic space for a Euclidean space, and therefore you might actually, not you, but one might have the temptation of dismissing it. Uh, that would be at our own expenses. Thank you very much. Sandra? Sandra Brayman, uh, can we push the space question one step further given what you just said? I was a little bit surprised that your concept of the envelope includes three dimensions, but not at minimum the fourth of time. Uh, yes, that was, um, um, as I, um, I, I tried to explain at the beginning, uh, was an attempt to provide a minimalist uh, version. Uh, for the Romans among us, uh, this is like testing a pizzeria by having a margarita. Uh, you never test a pizzeria by having a capricciosa. The capricciosa is suspicious. Now, if you want to have the capricciosa, we can add time, we can add agents, we can add all the toppings you like. But honestly, the, in industrial robotics, a space is what it is. Is the kind of Euclidean 3D. That's where you go. If you have a catalog, you are, say, a, a car maker, that's what you do. I agree with you. Of course there is time. There are many other things. And time is one important uh, uh, variable. But I wouldn't uh, uh, start with the complexity. So I welcome the addition. Um, I don't think that we should start with the complex uh, immediately. So yes, by all means, let's add time. You're right. Uh, Matt Sleet, uh, University of Sheffield. Um, thank you very much. I'm, I'm slightly confused, really, after you telling us how we need to recognize the elephant in the room. I'm slightly unclear what the elephant in the room is still in terms of what you think the actual threat is to hyper-historical societies. If hyper-historical societies are just characterized by dependence on information, it seems to me that the sheer fact there's more information and therefore more information to be threatened <laughs> isn't, isn't in itself something we should be that worried about, just about the difference in the amount of information. So what particular dependencies do you think are both new and the things that we should be scared of? I gather from your confusion uh, a sense of failure on my side of uh, conveying the message. Um, the point about the massive amount of data was there to show how um, increasingly um, rich and complex this uh, world is becoming. So it had nothing to do with and those data are the targets of cyber weapons. What I was saying is that, well, that feature, as many others, we don't have a limited amount of time, uh, and only a few toppings to add. Um, the, uh, that feature in particular, I think, is very telling, because it immediately clarifies to you that there is a difference. Now, when it comes to your question, I, again, I, I'm a rather simple-minded person, so I might be missing the point. But if you think of any sort of logistics in this country, any communication, any business-related activity, any medical-related activity, any security-related activity, anything you do from when you wake up in the morning to when you go to sleep, and you think, could I unplug? Then I hope the answer is no. If we switch off ICT from this society, we are unplugging the world, and that is something we cannot afford. The very fact that we haven't seen all the airports in this country being bombarded by digital means, it does not mean that it's not possible, and above all, it does not mean we should not be thinking about it right now, because someone just mentioned it. So I think the, I might have misunderstood your confusion. Please forgive me. But, if, but my particular point was trivial. We are living by the digit. That's all I mean. Our life depends so much, and increasingly more and more, on what we're doing with our cities, that there's no way 
that that can be kept as something that we do not care in terms of safety, control, military um, intervention if necessary. So I'm afraid it was, again, a rather margarita kind of uh, dish. It was a very simple point. Okay, and on the margarita, sorry, Mark, uh, it's very uh, actually appropriate because we're going to have uh, lunch in a few minutes. Uh, I, it must have, I must have felt that. <laughs> yeah, uh, Luciana, I think that, Anna Maria. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Luciana, very much for your talk.